Okay, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. I can hardly see you, but um, I hope you can hear me. So, welcome to this presentation. Um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about enterprises, enterprise com um, computing and communities. I think um, with the sort of people attending here, I'm pr I probably don't need to tell you too much about open source computing and communities, so I'm focusing a little bit on the enterprise aspect um, of this presentation. So, let's time warp a little bit back. 20 years ago, um, when I went to a party and, you know, somebody asked me, you know, what are you doing as a hobby, I started like, you know, I'm, you know, playing with this Linux thing, working on the kernel, and then after two minutes their eyes would start glazing over and then they wander off to the bathroom or <laughs> wherever they went to. Um, today it's a lot easier. So if, you have, if you're having the same sort of conversation today, you could say things like, you know, I work on the stuff that keeps your mobile phone running. Um, or chances are that you can just point to a random appliance somewhere and say, this is running the stuff that I'm working on. Okay. Um, or a bit more outlandish, no, this is not Darmstadt where I live. Um, this is Mars, and you could say things like, you know, I'm writing code that flies to Mars. Um, or you could talk about this one. Can you spot Linux in this picture? So the gentleman there is, of course, Steve Jobs. This is in 2011 when he was talking about the new data center they're doing in North Carolina, and the machines you see there are Teradata warehouse appliances. They run Linux. Actually, SUSE Linux Enterprise, to be precise. So Apple loves Linux, too. Um, and what you saw in that last picture, data centers, this is really what enterprise computing is about. And I find this a very exciting area. I like working in that area. Um, they have all this big hardware, these big iron machines. They do fancy things with all the components we put into the operating system. They come up with crazy ideas. So from a technology perspective, all this is very fascinating. But there's a different side to it. Um, enterprise commu uh, computing is also really a very, spe a very special ecosystem um, with lots of interesting plans and conditions and whatever. So let me talk about those, uh, let me talk about those a little bit. Um, in terms of cliches, I think um, there are a lot of cliches on both sides. Um, if I'm talking to a lot of people about enterprise IT, it'll probably come up, they probably come up with something like this. Not very agile, not very easy to have a conversation with. Um, they're just doing a little bit of code on top of my operating system. Um, so that's enterprise IT. And if you talk to enterprise people, Sometimes they will paint a picture about open source community that looks a little bit like this. <laughs> <Hooray>! <laughs> Not very easy to have a conversation with. Um, they start to laugh hysterically when we ask them for their roadmap. Um, <laughs> they're just a little bit of code underneath my application and they don't really understand my business needs. So it looks like we're all set for a very good collaboration, getting along with each other, right? Um, so, somewhat more seriously, um, open source communities, I don't think I have to tell you a lot about this. From what I see, open source communities are really about three things. One is contribution and participation. The other one is really about freedom and not the free beer variety. And the third one is about quality, okay? Enterprises, I think that is an area that not many people working in communities are too familiar with, so let me spend some time on those. Um, when you think of enterprise, you think big companies, you think lots of money, and consequently, their IT departments probably have a lot of money too, which is not true. They live between a rock and a hard place. They have been 
are faced with decreasing budgets for years, um, and they don't own everything, they're just a, a supplier. They're a service provider, and they have service level agreements, they have people with the applications breathing down their necks, and they're just trying to put together stuff that works well. The other important aspect is that for them, change is cost. For us, change is great because we can come up with great new ideas. For them, change is cost. They have to port their applications, they have to test them. Deployment can be hideously expensive if you have a very distributed organization with branch offices and whatever, and you have to send people there. Um, getting software certifications, training and support, so change for them is expensive, right? And even worse, for them, downtime is often very expensive, both in terms of money, so if you have a financial application or anything like that running on 24 by 7, if it's down for an hour, um, it's really a lot of money with a lot of zeros that we're talking about. And things get worse if you are in an area where human lives depend on the mission-critical applications, right? So you really don't want these things to go down. Um, let's move on to some real-life challenges that, we, that I have seen over the past 10, 15 years, um, which are really difficult to handle, but good to understand. Maintenance windows. Um, if you're running your own little park of machines like I do, then just updating is, okay, I sit down on a Saturday evening and I apply some changes, I install a new version, whatever. Um, in enterprise computing, that's, they don't have that liberty, right? They have maintenance windows um, that they have to adhere to, and that may be as little as 15 minutes a year. Now, if you run one of these big iron machines that takes eight minutes to boot, then you know exactly how many kernel updates you can do in one year. Um, a slightly different scenario is sometimes you have workloads running very, very long. And very long means about six months, eight months, ten months. And you can't really shut them down in the middle to apply the kernel update. The guys would kill you. Um, so maintenance windows play an important role in, trying, in talking about change in an enterprise environment. Talking about change, um, I, s I mentioned that rolling out new code is cost in an enterprise. So once they have it down pat, and it's perfect for them, they want to hold it there as long as they can. And for most of you, I guess a um, support cycle, a life cycle of 13 years sounds absurd. Um, but for many of these customers, it's just great. And they're asking, can, can we have two more years, please? Um, so really, this is a very different expectation in terms of how long something is around. Um, a slightly more extreme example is with ABIs. So we have got software vendors who build stacks on top of Linux that they want to sell to customers. And if they have to build that stack for three or four versions of your operating system, that means they have four times the expense. So they're trying to be smart. They say, I just built on my oldest supported version of this operating system, and I want to make sure that even the people who run the most bleeding edge version from that vendor can actually run my application nevertheless. And we've got several of those that we're very familiar with. Um, so to these people, ABI stability of the user space applications is really a crucial thing. And to them, ABIs are, of course, things like glibc, um, the X11 libraries and whatever, but it could also extend as far as, hmm, what do we do with these files in under slash proc or slash sys? This is shaky ground, I know. <laughs> But from their point of view, ideally, they would, like, they would like to count that as part of the ABI as well. We don't have to go there, but it's just to under illustrate where the appetite is coming from. Innovation, of course, I mean, when they, are, when they have their system set up for 13 years or longer, um, there's still need for innovation, right? Um, because they, they can't stay on that same old hardware forever. They need to deploy new hardware. The machines that will be around in five years from now 
are very different from those that are around today. So at the very least, hardware enablement is a major requirement for them. But of course, there are other things that they say that that would be nice to have. Now, interestingly, if you're dealing with enterprises, a lot of different enterprise customers, everybody has these three things they really need. Unfortunately, they all have different three things that they need. Um, so whenever we are talking about creating the next release, for instance, we have that choice to make between, okay, which of these things are important enough, which bubble up high enough to actually make it into the next version. So there is always this give and take between um, what, do, what is everybody asking for and what can we give them without being too disruptive. Another important topic in the past couple of years, compliance. Um, this is really about standards. Um, standard processes, and processes are a good thing on one, th on one side. If you're dealing with thousands of machines, having a process is good because it structures everything. On the other hand, there's a lot of legislation recently um, that sets certain standards for how to deal with credit card data, how to deal with financial data. So this is creating enormous pressure on the guys running these IT, um, these, uh, uh, the corporate IT of many companies. I think from my perspective as a citizen, um, having good control over what companies do with, with my data, with financial data, with credit card data is a great thing. Um, but for them, of course, it creates a lot of red, ta red tape and um, they have to adapt the way they roll out operating system releases, they certify them and so on. Um, another layer of complexity for them. Good. So, I talked a lot about the constraints these people are facing, but really what it comes down to, from my perspective, when we talk about enterprise computing, is um, adapting, innovating. Of course, we all, we've been talking a lot about these, these retrograde forces that actually hold them back, but at the same time, they want to move forward and they need to move forward. Um, at, first at first blush, it seems like it's very hard to get these two worlds together. Linux communities, open source communities on one side and enterprises on the other. And it feels a little bit like interstellar travel, but really it's something that needs to be done. From my personal view, I think one of the areas that Linux absolutely, uh, Unix absolutely failed in was being able to adapt, to have a way how to bring innovation forward. They all started out from the same code base and then they forked and forked and forked, and then they found themselves on this little planet that they had created without any meaningful and useful way to adapt, change, to innovate. Um, they could innovate in their little niche, but that was not enough. In the Linux world today, we're very different because on a very fundamental level, everybody is collaborating, everybody is working on the same set of innovation, and we can just take from that. So rather than being this little dinosaur race on this planet over here and another planet over here and yet another over here, we are working together to create something and then it's just the vendors becoming sort of the conveyor belts of bringing that innovation into their products and into the distributions. Um, let me go through this rather quickly. When we're talking about how to absorb change and bring them to the customers, there are four stages. One is don't touch anything for some time, which I think is a viable short-term option. I don't know how many of you actually um, update their phones every time it says, please update me. Um, I think it's a valid approach. Backporting patches, this is something that if you have an existing release, this is the default mode of operation, for instance, when you issue security updates or critical bug fix updates, you want to keep the risk low and you want to just plug this one little issue. Um, one thing here I want to mention is that actually a lot of the projects around are being very helpful with that respect, either by having um, 
policies that support that, or even by having a stable branch or regular stable releases like Firefox, for instance. Um, of course, there are also a few very really difficult ones out there. I'm not naming any names. But in general, what we're seeing is maintenance of enterprise distributions being a one-off effort. Um, it's converging towards sharing that effort more. And I think that's also good for Linux in general. Updating to a new version, that is something that we usually only do during service packs. But um, also there is al the, the, there's always the risk question, how much can you do? Um, there is a significant amount of quality assurance that you have to do there. Um, so there is a certain risk. But we found, and this is one of my favorite examples here, um, there is actually a good reason to start moving a little bit faster with these things. Um, traditionally, when it came to the kernel in a service pack, um, we were just backporting upstream patches, lots and lots of them. Um, so you end up with a Franken kernel over time that carries like 12,000 patches. Um, it works. I mean, we've proven that over 12, 15 years that it does, but it, um, there are better ways today, right? And that is also rebasing the kernel as part of a service pack update. Um, this is really a testament to the way the Linux kernel is being managed today. Um, the 2.6 development model for us has been really great. Um, it is at a very high level of quality, so we can just actually take out the old kernel, put in the new one, and rather than spending a lot of time on backporting patches, we can spend more time on hardening it, on looking for you know, all the enterprise scenarios that people are running to make sure that those are still valid. It does require a fairly sophisticated test automation, though, and a, wide, and a very wide coverage. And the last option here is replacing. Um, that means you just rip out one component and replace it with another. That's something you really normally only do in a major version update. Um, and even there, it can be very funny. What we just did in, S in SUSE Linux Enterprise 12, we replaced in it with systemd. Um, this is a major change, um, but I think it's a good change. It is a good replacement. It's great innovation. Um, and like any gr good innovation, it's very painful. <laughs> um, but still, surprise, actually to me, quite surprisingly, the feedback from the beta testers on replacing init with systemd was pretty positive. So I, I think that was a good move. Um, the important thing here from the perspective of the enterprise people is um, backward compatibility. That is really the key for everything. Okay, so I have a little bit under two minutes left, so let me go through my final couple of slides. Um, I talked a little bit about the maintenance windows. Um, that seems to be like a very hard problem to solve. Um, but actually, there is a lot of benefit to be had for the customers here, and this is why people have been looking into that repeatedly. In general, you can update a lot of the components pretty easily in a running system, so you don't really have to worry about those. The one critical piece is the kernel. You cannot replace the kernel without rebooting the machine, and I talked about these 15-minute maintenance windows for an entire year. So these people are really asking for kernel live patching. Modifying the kernel on a running machine without rebooting. This is really a little bit like juggling chainsaws. It's very easy to get hurt. Um, and you really don't want to try that at home without somebody nearby. Um, there are a couple of alternative approaches, some proprietary, um, some open. Um, the SUSE labs have been working on something called KGraft. I know that um, there are a few other projects out there, and I believe at the Plumbers Conference there will be a get-together to talk about the differences and what can be joined between these projects. We are launching that as an offering with SUSE Linux Enterprise 12. Um, in a nutshell, it replaces entire kernel functions. Um, it's compiled with PG, so it's really what Ftrace is doing. 
and you can just replace the function by modifying the preamble of that function. It's a little bit more tricky than that, um, but that's the bottom line. Um, as I said, it launches on top of SLE 12, um, and it's one of the things that we've been trying to get um, more innovative approaches into enterprises. Um, okay, I think I'm not going to get to any of those now. My time's up. Um, thank you so much for listening. Um, I appreciate that. Um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And with that, thank you very much. Have a good day.